so the idea of changing what we have been, the legacy of what we carry into a, con a continuous series of, of, of moments forever into the future and to situate ourselves to actually meet 21st century challenges, that seems like a lot. And it is, except the thing is, every other city does it all the time, all the time. Less than two weeks ago, 10 days ago, New York City passed a number of referenda questions that amends its charter. The city of Portland, Oregon, hit a hard reset on the essence, the core of its governance structure. It is not the first time for those two cities. Portland does this every 10 years. They don't change everything every 10 years, but they look at how things are working every 10 years. And there is not an election cycle that passes where New York City has not elevated to referendum consideration changes to its constitution. And we'll, we'll hit on those as we go. Next slide. So why? We don't have a constitution. I'm a law guy. I like constitutions. I teach constitutional law. Maybe it's just a, uh, maybe it's a fetish of mine, but no. Our current system, I think there is sort of a common sense that everybody has and observes and experiences that is dysfunctional in fundamental respects. And in point of fact, we lack checks and balances, processes, standards that foster sound decision-making and true accountability, said the former accountability guy. Transparency and access necessary for true community participation and engagement, participatory democracy is more often than not an afterthought or a false mechanism that comes after the decisions have already been made, but just before the final decision is announced. It's a check the box exercise and people feel that. So the absence of foundational elements that's in our civic DNA intrinsic to good government and intrinsic in our, our civic DNA as Americans, as Americans, we live in a constitutional culture in a constitutional democracy leaves Chicago largely carrying on through a series of customary past practices rooted in political structures that leave us, since there are no guardrails and there are no lane dividers that would be embodied in a constitution, largely engaged in raw transactional power politics that actually directly correlates to a lot of our chronic ills and our hovering sense of crisis that, that, that is always with us. Next slide. So again, Chicago, the only city, the largest 25 in the nation to operate without a, a, a city constitution. If you go to the next slide. So up here is a picture of Chicago's sixth city hall. We all know the seventh one. I'm gonna tell you a little story about the sixth one. After the Chicago fire, um, uh, there was a decision to build a new city hall that was to be resplendent and reflective of the world city that Chicago is striving to become. Um, it had a woeful, sorry history. It was massively over budget mostly because of the bribes that needed to be paid to get it built. It was way past schedule. It took seven years to build. And by the time it was built, it was largely obsolete. It wasn't up to code. It wasn't up to the post fire code. The city hall itself wasn't built to code. And it was dangerous because of that. And in point of fact, um, during the short time that it was in full operation, there was a massive fire. Thank you. And after the fire, um, the structural engineers went in and examined um, the, uh, the building to see whether it can and should be uh, restored. And the decision was it could be restored. So they started to restore it. But temporarily, here's why. 
it was sinking. That was our sixth city hall. We did not stop. We took a crack at a seventh. And on the seventh time, we got it right. Next slide, please. So is Chicago sinking? That's the building. Let's talk about the government and the city. Is Chicago sinking? It ranks among the most segregated and inequitable cities in the United States. That's a fact. Decades of struggles to keep residents from leaving, notwithstanding our best efforts, our population is now fully 1 million less than it was at its peak, and it continues to slide, slide, slide. There's a recent study published out of UIC in the last week or so that shows who it is that's leaving. Those that can leave have begun to leave. Um, and much of the attention is on the one percenters in this world where you can simply pick up and go live in Florida, but continue your business interests in Chicago uninterrupted. But there's more important aspects to it. Our black population is shrinking and our middle class is shrinking. Our middle class is really the indicator of the health of the city. And it is, it is dying at some level. We have more homicides annually than Los Angeles and New York City combined. And yes, there's conversation about other cities being the murder capital of, 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 of the country, um, but the numbers are horrific. And those are just the murders, the number of incidents of, of gun crimes and uh, people wounded um, by um, gun-related crimes, um, more than unacceptable more than Los Angeles and New York City combined. We have well over $500 million in police misconduct claims. Um, this year alone, it'll be over $100 million. We budgeted 82 million, and for the umpteenth year in a row, we've gone over that budget line appropriation. We've had structural deficits for two decades. And here's the thing about that, and this ties to why we need a constitution at some level. Um, the municipal code and state law says the budgets are supposed to be balanced. So how, how can we have structural deficits year after year after year if the law says the budget needs to be balanced? It's because we can change the rules on the fly because there are no higher rules and laws that dictate what the standards are and what the processes are. We fund operations by borrowing and selling off major assets in an unchecked fashion. We have more pension debt than 44 of the 50 U.S. states. And the city council, I don't need to read the last one out loud. Everyone knows about the city council. Next slide. So ReChicago aims to reset the functions, authority, and dynamics of power and responsibility within government and between government and the people through a citizen-driven process leading to voter-approved constitutional level changes in its municipal governance structure. That's a mouthful. But it's also fundamentally what cities around the country do. And they do at least on a generational basis and in some cities as a matter of law, far more often than generationally. Um, and our vision is that Chicago has the most effective, accessible, responsive and accountable big city government in the United States. What do we think? Is that a possibility? It is a possibility. Next, next slide. Um, and how are we going to go about that? Um, uh, one of the ways that we need to go about this business is to actually reflect the values, the principles, and the processes, which the mechanism for getting a city charter, a, com a charter commission, that our work actually model what we would need a charter commission to do for it to have legitimacy and for it to garner broad spread public support. Next. So what is a charter? A written constitution that spells out how city government works. Who writes the rules for government? Charter cities? The charter is written by the citizens and committee leaders working together in an official commission. In Chicago, the rules for government are written by elected politicians. And let me explain. When I say the city has no constitution, it's not that it has no higher law that sets the structure. 
It's something called the Cities and Villages Act that dates back to the 1940s, but it's very, very rudimentary. And all of the details that are filled into this broad space, we got a mayor, we have a clerk, we have a treasurer, we have 50 aldermen, the aldermen have to approve the budget, the mayor is the presiding officer over the city council, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, and this is how we um, uh, uh, divide up or, or go about the process of districting the wards. Not much else. Everything else is decided by the elected politicians in Chicago, reflected in the municipal code. That's law, but here's the thing. They can change it whenever they want to meet whatever immediate objective or purpose they have in mind. A constitution doesn't allow you to do that. There is a process for changing a constitution and it involves the people typically. So Chicago elected politicians, what role do voters have in the rules? For city charters, a majority of the electorate in a referendum must approve the form of government via election. The rules as we make them here, voters have no direct say. And let's talk about direct say for a second. Um, in the last week or so, there was um, a, a not uncommon move by the, by the mayor and her allies to introduce three referendum questions. Referendums are the means by which people directly get to say, whether it's advisory or binding, we would like a certain thing, or these are our views on a certain thing. We have a cap on that in Chicago. That comes from state law no more than three referendum questions on a budget. So what typically happens is the mayor and the allies simply stuff the ballot with three questions that they feel that they're comfortable with. And the questions that really get to change, those get crowded out, right? So literally, the voters have no say except through the medium of elections. And we all know how flawed the election process is, the electoral process actually is. Who can change the rules? Charter Commission itself and voter, voters via charter revision. And in Chicago, elected politicians can change the rules anytime. Next slide. There's a standard for how this can and should be done and is done in the rest of the country. And that's the National Civic League, which has been around since the late 19th century and over 100 years, 130 years. Um, and it is on its ninth edition of a model charter for municipalities, ninth edition. They have had nine model charters published since um, we had our seventh city hall come online for operation in 1911. Um, its most recent model published just a year ago um, and the changes were made um, precipitated by um, the civil unrest and demonstrations across the country after the murder of George Floyd, um, incorporated and prior prioritized re uh, recommendations regarding diversity and equity and police accountability. It is something that is green and evolving over time. And this is a really important thing. Next slide. Um, so if things were going great, the idea of having a constitution would be like, yep, but does it really matter? Do we really need it? Do we really need to go through the process? There are some values that would be served by it, but do we re really need to do it? Well, let's talk about some examples of why it matters in ways that are really tangible to everybody. There's a few pictures up there. I'm gonna quickly tick through them. The Chicago Police Department, how we go about or have gone about picking a police superintendent. There are actually laws, the municipal code, you know, those things that can be changed by elected politicians. Um, in 2015, the process for picking a police superintendent was the police board conducts a national search and puts on the mayor's desk three finalists. And the mayor is supposed to, by law, pick from those finalists. The mayor didn't like who he was provided for a choice. The law said, you got to go back to the police board and they got to come up with more names for you. Right, mayor said, nah, not gonna do that. Went to the city council, got them to pass a law that suspended the operation of that procedure for 30 days. Introduced the name of the police superintendent at that time, Eddie Johnson, 
approved by the city council because the city council largely operates as a rubber stamp, except these days things are a little more interesting. Um, and then everything returned back to normal. We suspend the law so that the mayor could have his way. Bally's Corporation, the casino. So I mentioned before, the mayor um, controls the city council. And just think about that for a second. Um, city council is the legislature. In our civic DNA is the notion that legislatures are supposed to be a check and balance on executive power. So here's what the mayor does here in Chicago. As the presiding officer of the city council, it's a question about what that really means. But in Chicago, um, the city council has ceded the authority to um, select who the committee chairs are. Those committees are the check and balance. They are all the mayor's allies. For the sake of uh, a casino, here's what the mayor did. She basically charged the creation of a special committee constituted of the chairs of the regular committees, which are her allies, to hold a single hearing to approve a casino without all of the requisite details necessary to understand exactly what we were doing. And there was an example very quickly that, a couple of examples that followed very quickly as to why that was a bad, a, a bad move on our part. One is Wall Street, the bond rating agencies almost immediately said Bally's is gonna have problems raising the money necessary for the Chicago casino, right? Second, a couple months later, there's a traffic study done on the temporary casino. That traffic study was done by Bally's itself, an interested party. <laughs> That's a new point for me. During the pandemic, the audience member said, That's government. That's government being handed over to an interested party. And that's what we do here if ultimately the objective is something that the executive wants, all right? Um, on the left, uh, left side, pay to park, quick reference to the parking meter deal. Um, we all know about the parking meter deal. Um, there was actually a competitive process, um, but not a lot of transparency to it at the time. Mayor made a decision. Um, it got introduced to the city council and 72 hours later, the city council approved the sale of one of our biggest revenue generating assets, not sale, lease for 75 years. That constitutes a sale for me. I won't be around at the end of the lease. Bye-bye. Um, that couldn't happen in charter-based cities around the United States. It simply could not happen. And I'm going to explain. I'm going to actually, I'll do it right now. Here's what would happen in New York City on the basis of what's written into their constitution that would go to the city council. The city council would immediately refer it to an independent body called the Independent Budget Office that operates like the Congressional Budget Office. Professionals who know, who know fiscal stuff, financing stuff, budget stuff, they would score that piece of legislation, that deal. They would score it relative to what the market might allow. And they would send a report, a public report that the city council gets about their, their independent evaluation of that deal. And then the city council would have to hold a subject matter hearing on that particular piece of legislation, that particular deal. And it's of such a magnitude that probably in New York, it would have had to go to referendum to sell off something that big, right? Not here, 72 hours later. And I think the vote was something like 42 or 43 to nothing, almost, Almost nobody who voted for it knew much of anything about it because the city council only sees what the mayor wants them to see and understand. All right. More recently, on the right, it's a picture of the Abla homes. Um, CHA land, essentially held in trust, is supposed to be for public housing. And again, by manipulation of processes of the city council, manipulation of the parliamentary rules. Um, we transferred that land for cheap on the basis of a contract that nobody got to see before it was submitted for approval to the Chicago fire. I love soccer. But transferring land held in public trust for public housing for the purpose of a practice facility for a professional soccer team 
owned by coincidentally one of the largest donors to the current mayor. That's Chicago. That's how Chicago works. This in the middle at the bottom is a picture of the chaos of the city council. Anybody here who is following what's going on right now knows that the city council is in um, complete really chaos. It's sort of pitched battle. And it's a very strange kind of revision, or sorry, revisiting of the energy um, on the council floor. We couldn't find a picture of Dick Mel standing on a desk, banging it with his shoe or anything like that, but of the same kind of chaotic feel that you see depicted in Punch Nine. And for those who have been around for a while and lived that, there was sort of a PTSD aspect. But if you haven't seen Punch Nine, definitely go see it. Next slide. But that's Chicago. That's what happens without a constitution. That's what happens without a higher form of law that sets forth the power balance, the processes, the, the functions, the supporting functions. Um, so how are, the, how are other cities, charter-based cities, making progress um, through their charters? The city council, the legislative body. Um, many cities have recalibrated the structure, authority, and operation of the city council to actually be an effective, independent, legislative oversight body, and equally important, driver of policy. Power and operations, most city councils that are charter-based uh, and charter-based governance, their president or presiding officer is selected internally. The same for their committee chairs. They have investigative authority, subpoena power, oath-giving authority, the power to compel appearances. The power to compel appearances and subpoena people. The president of the CTA. It took four bites at the apple to get the president of the CTA to actually appear at a city council transportation committee hearing over the course of 2022. And it was only the fact that the city council's vote would be needed for the approval of a TIF that would extend or at least provide preliminary approval for the extension of the red line and take um, uh, and, and, and approve the transfer of certain funds from the federal government to the CTA for its operations. It is only that last minute need that actually brought the president of the CTA into the city council. In every other city in the country, there would be an obligation of that official to appear. And if they didn't appear, they could be compelled. And if they didn't comply with um, being directed or ordered to come and appear, there could, be a, there could be a lawsuit filed and they could be ordered by a court to appear. The structure around the country, there, we have in modern times grappled with composition. Portland changed the size uh, of the city council and broke it out into a combination of district-based seats and at-large seats. There's all sorts of conversation to be had about, about the merits one way or the other of that. LA has done that, New York did that back in the, the late 80s. Term limits staggered terms, special elections for vacancies. Um, parenthetically, are cities just examples of cities? These things are common and commonly worked out through Charter Commission. Next slide. Um, standards and processes, standard-based budgetary processes. Charters constitution set accounting standards, budget standards, debt ceilings debt ceilings that have to be raised as a matter of law, the way the Congress does it, the way the Congress has to do it um, in the federal government, sometimes having to go to referendum, sinking funds, rainy day funds, independent fiscal evaluation, New York City, Austin, Texas, lots of other cities. More recently, written into the constitution of cities, the requirement of equity and environmental impact statements. There was an amazing provision that was passed by the people in New York last week that actually obligates the city of New York to calculate the true cost of living on a much broader basis that is, than is generally, that is generally done at the federal level, the state level, the local level. Um, and in doing so, that essentially will change the terms of discussion about the impact of city policy on the lived experience of people in community. It will actually change the discussion about what we need to prioritize as a city government. It's written into the constitution now that you need to put on the table in a public way that broader calculus 
policy and process incorporating community engagement, originating with independent representative community bodies. Yes, we have community engagement in Chicago. Yes, we have a chief engagement officer. But all of this is sort of discretionary stuff that's soft around the margins. It's not something that's in, in integrated and insinuated across all city operations. Why? There isn't a driver for it. And frankly, that tends to fall to the bottom of the priority list. Um, and in doing that, delegitimizes the good things that our government does, right? People feel alienated even if the outcome is the right outcome. Why? Because their voice hasn't been heard. Independent budget offices, comptrollers, and a lot of cities around the country on the basis of an examination of the, of the elected officers, um, uh, um, some cities elect their comptrollers. Why? There's an independent professional set of standards a comptroller is supposed to be following. They're not supposed to be acting on the basis of the politics of the mayor. We have a wonderful comptroller, professional standards, but the fact of the matter is there isn't real independence. What we know of the comptroller, what comes out of the comptroller's office actually has this sort of political brick on it, right? In some cities, the city's uh, chief lawyer, what we call corporation counsel, also elected, all right? These are things that other cities are working through and thinking, thinking about. Next slide. The people. Democratic initiatives. This has become common in charters as well around the country. Citizen initiated referenda. I mentioned what happens in Chicago, what happened in Chicago very recently. Recall and removal provisions. We actually have them for certain officers at the state level. We do not have them in Chicago. There's pros and cons about how you go about that. You do not want to have a destabilizing aspect to all of this. But frankly, if people are really, really unhappy with something that has gone on or is going on, let me just, a quick aside here. And I don't want to pick on a guy when he's down, but the chairman, Alderman Ed Burke, has a decision to make in the next 10 days as to whether he's going to run for re-election for the second time while under federal indictment, right? Recall provisions actually might address that more directly. Um, proactive data and information transparency, that's not just cities in the United States, that's also our global peer, world-class cities like London. Standards about data, the quality of data, how data needs to be put forward in a user-friendly way, information transparency that sort of leans into the principles and the practices around what we generally refer to as FOIA, which actually is a broken system, right? Elevate that to constitutional standards. You can't play fast and loose quite so much as we do here. Independent redistricting, public campaign financing, ranked choice voting. Now, here's the thing about all of these things. I'm not advocating for these. Re Chicago isn't going to advocate for these things. People want to know what I think. What I think doesn't matter. I'll be part of the, I'd be part of a discussion with anybody. But the point is that the people should decide which of these things are part of their system of governance. And the way that we go about it is that each one of these things, if they're approached, are approached independently. And there's an immediate divide and conquer and capture and consigning to the sideline the efforts of good people in community to get various of these things and other things as well. Um, so Chicago, the third largest city in the country, is it really crazy to put Chicago in participatory democracy in the same sentence? Yes, it's crazy, it's radical, it's revolutionary, except back to what I said earlier. Everybody else does it. We are the third largest city for now. Up here, New York City, hard reset on its governance structure in 1990. A couple of prompts for it, partly a federal lawsuit that said part of the city violated one person, one vote. Um, but then a massive, a massive corruption scandal in the third term of the Ed Koch administration prompted this broad examination and reset, two years process involving hundreds of community hearings, and they hit a hard reset, sweeping changes on the structure of their government. Elected, who's elected? 
the powers of the city council, how the powers of the city council relate to the mayor and other components of government, the processes that the city council follows for budgeting. Let's talk about budgeting for just a quick second. Chicago, budgeting. It's a two and a half week hearing process for something that the mayor drops in full detail. And I'm not picking on this mayor. This is time immemorial. Um, in New York City, it's written into their constitution, their municipal charter, it's a four to five month process. And the first process, the first round is basically level setting. How is the current year going? How are the current appropriations meeting the program and mission objectives of each of the department? What are the challenges that we're facing? And if performance is poor, let's talk about that. And what happens is every department has to send in the submission for basically a preliminary budget that includes all that information about the current year, and it goes to the independent budget office and it gets scored. And then it goes to the city council and there's real, there's real subject matter hearings. And then the final budget comes and then it gets scored again. And then it goes to the budget committee. Four to five month process. We basically have a two and a half week process. And there is no way, think about it from the perspective of the police department, Lawrence Massal of the Civic Federation, speaking in the public portion of the hearings, which is the last day of the hearings, the budget hearings. Um, he got three minutes because everybody only gets three minutes, said the police department budget is incomprehensible. It's impenetrable. There's not enough detail. There's not enough that even tells us what this ask is going to do to change where we are and the struggles that we're obviously having. Los Angeles, 1999. It's modern times for people with gray hair. There's a fair number of people with gray hair in the room here. Um, uh, they hit a significant reset on the structure of their government, prompted by a secession movement in parts of the city because of rising property taxes. That should be familiar to everybody here, but also their struggles with how the police department was being managed and the inevitable reform that was necessary, police accountability as they headed into a consent decree. Um, next slide. So the two largest cities can do it. And all 25, except for one of the largest cities actually do this. Question is, what's up with us, right? So, re-Chicago, the first stage of our ongoing work, local and national research and interviews um, that we conducted during the summer and throughout the fall. We have a partner in that at the University of Chicago, um, the Harris School in particular, direct engagement in community, um, we have partners for that, the University of Illinois Chicago, and working towards partnership with DePaul University, engagement of national experts on municipal governance. This is an information gathering process, um, policy analysis on governance, uh, governance across major cities in four key areas, police accountability, um, budget and finance, community engagement, and the city council itself. Um, relationship and capacity building for a civic movement. Why a civic movement? Well, here's what history tells us. I mentioned New York and Portland. Portland, the law is every 10 years, there needs to be a revision commission. And it's up to the commission and actually the people to decide just how thoroughgoing the revisitation of the city's governance structure is going to be. This time, Portland went large. In New York City, it's every couple of years. Um, and interestingly about New York, um, the much of the conversation in New York is maybe we've gone too far on the democracy front and the participation front because we're having trouble getting certain things done. This is an iterative process that's constantly changing, but it can only change if you're having the, the conversations that are necessary, the analysis to do this. Chicago, last time we've holistically looked at our governance structure was the 1950s. And that resulted in almost nothing. Why? Because uh, a Home Rule Commission um, reported out literally six to nine months before Richard J. Daley became mayor, right? The time before that, the turn of the 20th century, 1907, 1908, when we were building the seventh city hall. Um, and there, what happened was the good government groups that led the charge on this exercise did not include community. There is a celebrity that's in the room. Mr. Blakemore, welcome. You are a celebrity. <laughs> so this is of the people 
by the people, for the people, but it has to be with the people if it's actually going to change. Um, that's, what less, that's what history counsels in the absence of actual movement. We always revert to the mean in, mean in Chicago because it's Groundhog Day, always. One more, next, last one. So if everybody else does it, if it's a national best practice, if we know that things aren't going well, if we know we can't continue doing things the way that we do them, the question is, how can we not do this? And for those of you with gray hair, how can we not do this for our children? For those of you who are younger, how can this not be done in order to situate the city to actually truly optimize the opportunities that exist? Because for most of our problems, we have agency. This is a rich city in just about every measure and means. We control our destiny, but we're not going to do it with a paradigm that's failed. We're not going to do it with a continuation of power politics that depends upon the person. And that ultimately, and I will say this, there is no system that long succeeds if it depends on, rises, it completely depends on the decision making of one person. And that is what we have in Chicago. We need checks and balances to elevate that critical tension, to elevate policy discussions, to assure true accountability. A charter commission is the way of doing that. That's what we're pushing for. That's what we hope to elevate in the coming, in the coming months. Um, and um, I hope um, this actually grabs some of you because everybody needs to be in on this. Thanks. How we get this going, um, so I, I mentioned the first stage work, and the hope is that actually we come forward um, with content in multiple media. Um, the media is very interested in this. Um, a lot of elected politicians are interested in this, but elevate this in the middle of what is a campaign season. So it's actually something that's discussed during the campaign season. While the politicians are doing their debates, um, uh, um, I will need help going into community and actually conducting the forums with, with this foundational content um, that we have been working towards. But ultimately, the big process is that this needs to um, go to Springfield. There's multiple ways of bringing about a charter commission. One is referendum of the people. That's a long process. You need lots of signatures on petitions. That's a year or two years, right, to even get into the game. The second is the mayor and the city council decide this is something that they want to do. That delegitimizes it coming out of the box right there, right? The third thing is um, legislation in Springfield that changes the Cities and Villages Act, and it would do two things. One, it would sunset the existing provisions that relate to Chicago and Chicago alone because there's a special portion of that that, relate, that that pertains to Chicago. And the second is the charging of the creation of a commission that needs to be diverse, diversely selected. There needs to be timetables that are written into it, but that's draft legislation. And then once, once that is authorized, the commission does its work. It's probably a 12 to 18 month process for them to report out with a specific deadline written into law. And that becomes a mandatory referendum. Portland, Oregon just went through that process. If you read the news in Portland, Oregon, it is they've begun a transition period for, for the change that was dictated by their charter commission. Yes. So um, I came here today straight from a meeting of about 20 community organizers and activists. 
grappling with the question of what democracy means, what it looks like on the way to deeper conversation about what we need to do to bring that through their networks, through the people that they represent, through the organizations and interests um, that, that they represent and work for, how to bring that into community. I mentioned New York City earlier, 200 community forums conducted. What, I'm, what I am looking for is the insights of the leaders within community about narrative, language, what matters and doesn't matter, and how to connect with them at the level of real sort of round table in community conversations. Um, because to discuss a charter is just too obscure, right? And so we really need to connect people to the notion that actually is foreign in Chicago, that the government is theirs. Most people don't know in Chicago that the government is theirs. It's because it, it doesn't function that way. And a quick aside on that, when I started talking about this um, uh, and feeling my way through it, I had a conversation with um, the Reverend Marshall Hatch Sr. on the West Side. And I was speaking about it in terms of our government being broken, because when I left his IG, I thought the government's broken. And he said, it's not broken. It's fixed. Thus the title of this talk, Unfixing Chicago. It works exactly the way it's supposed to work. And most people realize that, which is why they feel alienated from it. And so it's a lot of conversation, a lot of dialogue. But to your point, that is done only through exactly the type of people that you're talking about. Yes. So um, the the place, and I've talked to Madeline and her her crew, Madeline Dubeck, who heads um, that organization and and led that effort, the People's Map effort. The problem was that the people that needed to approve that map that they devised through real community process were the same elected officials who it was going to impact, and so they all made assurances. They were for this as a matter of principle. When push came to shove, they all did what they always did. This does not depend upon the elected officials to approve this. This goes to the people. And that's right. And here's, here's the moment. Everyone's scared. Everyone knows this is not going well. They have different reasons for why they are scared. Those who, many of those uh, sort of constituent interests that benefit from the status quo, recognize that we're running out of runway with respect to our finances, with respect to our populations. We're challenged by crime and what that's doing within our city. Um, that's one end of the spectrum, it tends to be the more conservative end of the spectrum. Within community itself, what I just said that Marshall Hatch told me, just like, nope, this whole thing is broken, right? And everybody in between. Legislators who represent Chicago and Springfield tend to be Democrat, right? They recognize this. And they're concerned about a city that has no guardrails and runways that are, fun uh, sorry, lane dividers that is fundamentally necessary to the health of the state. And downstate legislators who tend to be more conservative, we all know what stereotypes they have of Chicago. They have spoken of the need for guardrails and lane dividers. Is that wishful thinking on my part? You bet it's wishful thinking on my part. It's a long road here, but that's why movement is really important. Why? That's why the voice of the people needs to be gathered, understood, and heard. So that the politicians understand this, the, the, people, the people feel like this has to happen across the spectrum. One more here, two more here, and then, and then quickly pivot to... It, it, so it's the place that everybody goes. Um, and I will tell you, sorry, um, uh, um, <laughs> the, re 
the reductionist version of the question regarding the city council is, does size matter? Um, and um, this has been discussed in Chicago, debated. It's where everybody goes immediately for the last 150 years. And the city council was set at 50 in the early 20s, okay? Um, and it churned and changed all the time. We use that as sort of the first place to go. But here's the thing. The city council could be a great council at 50 if it had the right structure and the right authority and the right feedback loops and the right supporting mechanisms. The question about the size is really how representative we want the city council to be of community and how we go about selecting wards and how we go about financing elections. Because right now, the elected officials get to largely decide their wards. And what tends to happen is most of the wards in the city are monocultures, which allow elected officials to actually orient their thinking to a very, very special sort of subset of constituency across the city. Very few aldermen represent diverse wards. And those diverse wards actually require aldermen to think in terms consistent with what's best for the city and all of its people, right? So the answer may be it's 50 with the right structure. The answer may be we need to take the whole thing down, shrink it by half, um, which a lot of cities do. Another answer may be it needs to be partly district, partly at large to introduce that sort of whole city thinking right into things. This is a conversation that needs to be had. It's not simply how big it is. Um, it's a good idea. It won't be business as usual, but it's actually, it was, it was necessitated by um, something that a charter needs to still address. The reason that the CCPSA um, it was needed um, is um, for there to be um, a platform for amplification of voice of community perspective, one, and for there, there to be real hearings on matters relating to policing and police accountability which the Public Safety Committee of the City Council does not hold. There should be almost weekly meetings of the Public Safety Committee that is staffed properly by people with expertise in the area, talking about the vast, broad welter of challenges we're having both with respect to crime, policing, police reform. We have almost no, and this is one of the things that, that that um, the, the research we're doing right now, how often do committees actually meet? What do they meet on? What do they hold votes on? Um, how much of this is window dressing? The CCPSA is a really complicated organization as it was devised partly to assure that there are community representatives all the way at, at the ground where people live. We'll have to see how it works out. The complicated part of it means that it could be Chicagoed. We'll have to see, but coming out of the box, Simply having a hearing and a report on the police budget independently offered and critiqued, that's what the Public Safety Committee of the City Council should be doing. It hasn't operated that way in as long as I've known Chicago. Yep. Um, uh, the question is, is um, how big is the staff of Re Chicago and um, what sorts of partnerships um, uh, are we developing? Um, Re Chicago, the organization, has two employees. All right. Um, uh, this was referred to in the media as a passion project, and that is exactly right. Um, but as we bring the conversation out, um, we are, and I mentioned, I mentioned three universities, um, it goes much further than that. All of the good government groups have said this is something that really needs some serious attention. Um, I mentioned the conversation that immediately preceded this meeting. Um, those are the sorts of conversations specifically to identify who those trusted messengers and facilitators in community are, 
because again, we got to build a, a movement around this. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm, it has to be a diverse array. Um, there's a premise that I enter into this. Uh, I entered into this with that is almost certainly wrong, but I'm hoping is right, which is you ask people across the city from different communities and constituencies about their experience of government and their critique of government, people and organizations that are oppositional to each other typically and antagonistically oppositional to each other because they're chasing the opposite sides of the same thing. Everybody has the same critique. Everybody has the same concern. They may articulate it differently, but that is the point of our commonality and a recognition that things, everybody knows that things can't go on the way they do go on. Einstein's definition of insanity, continue to do the same thing and expect a different result, right? That's the hope, but we're building partnerships and I'm hoping the League of Women Voters and all of the folks that were within the League of Women Voters who have their own networks have further conversation with me about it. The, the, the point is that we don't have a balance. Um, uh, one of my side hustles for a long time has been teaching national security law, which is basically about checks and balances in Congress and the fact that we have over the years given too much power and authority and discretion to the executive without real oversight. That's Chicago too. Um, and so ultimately this is about a recalibration of power um, coupled with um, the proper uh, authority to make sure that there is those checks and balances that provide for balance. But it's not just, I can, I, I've, I've used the phrase guardrails and lane dividers a number of times to give structure to things. But what comes of that is the essential tension, the deliberative process that elevates the quality of the decisions that we make about policy and how we prioritize things and elevates the systems of accountability, both written into the law and after the fact. Um, so fundamental to most cities when they hit the, that hard reset is, is the power of and the distribution of power between the executive and the legislative branch. So, so, so um, uh, the, the question is, is that as we move towards other elected um, uh, components of city government, the, 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 the school board, um, um, uh, the civilian police accountability um, commission, and so on and so forth, school board 21, CCPSA is going to be 66, right? And we have local school councils. How far do we go on that? Well, we're supposed to get stuff done. And that's part of the conversation that we need to have because um, you need to balance um, democracy and the mechanisms of democracy. And democracy does not require massive scale representative elections. Democracy has all sorts of different models. We have our notion in mind of what it means. Um, frankly, other countries and other cities around the world work quite well um, on the basis of, of markets that work differently from ours, politics and cultures that work differently from ours. We actually should be, beyond looking at what's going on around the country, be looking, looking internationally at best models and practices as well. But to, to, to my earlier observation, New York went way far on elected um, bodies, um, including an independent elected body of, of, on community engagement all the way at the borough level and down into the communities. Um, and it's unmanageable. Same thing happened in LA, it's unmanageable. So there is that calibration, but here's the thing, a hundred years of cities doing this in charter-based systems, we have this massive wealth of knowledge about what hasn't worked in communities and cities like ours. 
and what has worked. Um, and again, all of this, this is blank slate, greenfield, iterative. And because we don't have a constitution, we don't have to work up from something that isn't working quite well that distracts everybody as to where it's not working. We actually have the opportunity to have the discussion about the government that we want holistically. And regardless of where this gets, why we wouldn't want to have that conversation at this time, I simply don't know. And I suspect none of you know as well. So let's get going on it. Mr. Mr. Blakemore, I always. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> so but Mr. Blakemore is the conscience of the city of Chicago, and he brings that conscience through an amazing voice into every city council meeting that is had if he is allowed to speak, if you are allowed to speak. Um <laughs> Um, but 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 the fact that it's a one party city actually matters in in what needs to be what needs to be baked into a new structure. But here's one thing that I will say, and I wasn't asked to do this, George, um, a plug for the League of Women Voters for this reason, not voting is a vote, not voting is a vote for the status quo. And if you want to elect the bums, uh, if you want to if you want to turn the bums out of office, you got to vote them out of office, especially in a one party state. 